One time, a prisoner not that many years ago used a homemade pair of nunchaku, chair parts, and some bedsheet material to fight his way through one dozen guards and smash his way through glass and to freedom. Temporary freedom, but they did the job. Now, granted, this is a medium security facility, uh, but these are still prison guards. They're still professionals trained to deal with violent criminals and uh, who have to do so on a regular basis. That was an atypical way to start a video about Nunchaku, but I'm going to do a lot of atypical things, like cover actual data instead of just giving my opinion. And yeah, we'll break stuff too. Well, it's been for a long time now that I've wanted to make a video about this weapon here on the right and how it stacks up against its competitors. After 300 some odd videos, I guess I'm finally doing a response video. I don't like that, but I guess I am. Because uh, Shad over at Shadiversity, fantastic channel, made the case in two separate videos uh, that a lot of people make that the Nunchaku is a terrible weapon. In short, that it isn't dangerous enough for your opponent while being far too dangerous for you, the user. As you might guess, I uh, completely disagree. While understanding the merits of that argument, I've always found the Nunchaku to be simultaneously the most overrated and underrated weapon in the world. And that is not an easy thing to be, so how can it be? Well, the first problem is that almost nobody handles real Nunchakus, and I mean that, honestly. Like, if you look online, all these different videos, whatever, you know, pair you see being used are not quality Nunchaku. Here you see what a real pair can do. Now, sure, those are on the larger side, but still, you know, quality wood meant for striking, like most of, I'm gonna go with nunchucks now, <laughs> like most nunchucks today are not. Case in point, I went to the largest and longest running martial arts store in my area. It's quite large and extensive. It's been around uh, since I started studying in the early 90s. It had been around for a long time before that. Had the same owner the whole time. She really knows her stuff. I walked in, there's nunchucks all over the wall. I said, hey, I need a pair for striking. She said, here, this is the only pair I have for that. And she sells quality stuff, but she caters to the market. 99.9% .9 of the time, people aren't buying a pair that they're ever going to hit anything with. Here's another example. I went to Century Martial Arts. I'm sure you're familiar with them, right? They've been selling this stuff forever. I'm looking at their nunchucks, the options. Not one what I would consider a true heavy-duty striking pair. Not one. And I imagine you can see where I'm going with this. Uh, you can't judge nunchucks as a weapon unless you're holding a pair that's an actual weapon. A uh, friend of mine owns these, and I'm jealous. This is Coca-Bolo. And keep in mind, wood quality is really going to matter because, you know, what is what are nunchucks? It's two sticks, each about the length of your forearm, that are an inch in diameter. Inch and a quarter. That's it. Are they indestructible? Of course not. Can they break? Of course they can. You know, just like any one-inch diameter wooden rod you know, smacked up against something really hard, right? Here's my pair that I use uh, in my stress tests coming up uh, when we get to smash stuff. So, God, I've had these for a long time. I mean, I had these when I was training for my black belt in Kobudo, which I got a long time ago. Uh, I was really worried I would break these. <laughs> they are of sentimental value. I love the new pair, uh, but these are the ones I use when I smash stuff. And yeah, these are made for hitting. But now let's talk about comparing these to their competitor tools, right? First of all, nunchucks, we're comparing them to other and similar impact weapons. Of course, a knife is more dangerous. But this is a type of baton, and it has all the advantages and disadvantages that a simple baton has. Here I'm using a classic rattan stick, right? Very light, very fast. Here's my homemade shillelagh that I did a video on a long time ago. Much more stout, much slower, but it's gonna hit much harder. Especially because I loaded the inside of the striking head with metal. But look at that beast. I can't hide this thing. Not at all. It's not concealable. Just holding it, even if you just appear to be using it as a walking stick, any fool would know that you are armed. You have something you could use as a weapon. What about a much lighter and much thinner stick, though? So, back to the speed comparison here. Where I'm going with this, guys, I'll just skip ahead, is the Nunchaku gives you the speed of the light tool that I've been handling here, but with the heft, the impact, of the heavy tool. I watched seemingly every video on the Nunchaku that there is on YouTube, uh, not just Shad's, and I don't think anybody kind of makes this point. It's really underappreciated. And back to the concealability, even this feather light rattan stick cannot be hidden at all. I mean, it's basically the size of a, size of a sword. Meanwhile, 
one of the real killer apps with nunchucks is not only can they be easily hidden, but they can lash out instantly from full concealment to full power. And not only can they do that, they can do it at the length of an extended baton. Not just a baton. Keep in mind the shillelagh and the eskrima stick there are not just longer, but much longer than a standard single stick. For instance, back when American police carried uh, wooden hard clubs, they weren't much longer than a foot. The quote-unquote nightstick, meant for extra hazardous night duty, was two feet long. Actually, a little bit more. So the nunchaku can go from full concealment to striking at nightstick length. Speaking of swinging, you swing a nunchaku like you're actually going to hit something. With power, with extension, not like you're a majorette on the cheer squad. Now for a first break. And I know, that's just one plank you're thinking, but this is not the kind of wood you use in karate class. If you guys remember from uh, some of my past videos, this wood here is really tough. Neither an all-metal ASP baton nor an all-metal jute were able to do anything except slightly dent that wood. Meanwhile, my nunchaku were almost unscathed as they tore through it. There you see the damage. Very small. And again, we're talking about wood that this guy here, jute that my buddy Derek made for me, all steel, solid, didn't even come close to breaking. And for those of you who saw the video, you might recall I hit the wood with the ASP and with the jute exactly as you would hope to. Not with the flat, but with the tip, at an angle, digging in, I mean maximum concentration of force, and all they could do is put dents into the wood that perfectly fit the head, right? It was like a puzzle piece. Uh, and they probably went in like, I don't know, a quarter of an inch, something like that. And the bottom line here is I can guarantee you I would not want to take a shot to the cranium from either that ASP baton or that steel jute. Meanwhile, I think I proved conclusively the wooden nunchaku hits much harder. And by the way, the damage here shows that I also struck appropriately with this tool, right? With the edge, maximizing the force. That's obviously much easier to do against a stationary target, but if you train with this thing as an actual weapon and not a majorette twirling baton, that's how you should naturally strike. And that's what I did. I didn't think about that when I struck the board, and that was a full power swing. I just naturally hit right with the edge. So, one, I guess I'm patting myself on the back for my technique, <laughs> but more importantly, it really was an apples-for-apples apples true comparison with the three instruments. And now, understanding that these planks are something that would break your hand before they would break, let's test my assertion about going from concealment to full power. Raise my hand for distraction. Boom. Hey, I don't want any trouble. Half a second later, significant impact delivered at a, you know, Formidable length, like we said, right? Nightstick length. Extended single stick length. Those of you familiar with the lamb method for the police baton would recognize this movement here, this shot to the leg. Obviously, with a strike like this, you get to follow through more than you would in, like, a combat swing, but we're going to get to that too, so don't worry. Like here, right? This is a full follow through. Notice I raise my left hand to allow the weapon to swing over. Something that a lot of people miss about this, you don't have to catch the nunchaku in combat. In fact, doing so robs you of one of the weapon's unique advantages, which we're going to get to, which is the very fast 100% counterswing. Hey, look, it's the great Bruce Lee, the man absolutely responsible for the Nunchaku becoming a worldwide sensation. So let's talk a little bit about the weapon's history and use, and this is part of how it can have such diametrically opposed schools of thought. Shad and others saying it's, quote, garbage and also basically, at best, better than nothing, or so badass and dangerous that basically every government on Earth has to treat it like it's as dangerous as, a, I don't know, a hand grenade. Here's uh, Sensei Demura, by the way, and man, back in the day, his uh, books and videos, that was the stuff. You'd get a hold of one and try to replicate the moves. He did a lot to popularize this weapon at Kobido in general. Anyway, it was things like this, but especially the movies, and especially Bruce Lee, of course, that made this weapon so popular that we actually have a lot of data about how effective nunchucks are or are not, but it's actually modern Western data. I mean, we actually know more about them from 1970s and 80s American street criminals, you know, New York gangs and whatever, than we do about how they were actually used or how often used in Okinawa back in the day. Well, being a weapons author and researcher, I want to go with documented evidence, expert opinions, things like that. I'm not just going to give you my opinion. So, here's a classic book by the legendary Masad Ayyub. 
And this is a real time capsule, this is neat. Just listen to this verbiage here. Fad weapons come and go among the street punks. Guns, knives, bludgeons. The basic concept is always there, but variations come in waves. Skipping ahead now. Bludgeons too have been updated. They call the new version by a number of slang names. Chucks, nunchucks, chockers, karate sticks, killer sticks. True practitioners of the martial arts know it by a more revered name, nunchaku. So how did a blue chip expert in street violence and police use of force from the time when nunchakus were at the height of their popularity on the street, what did somebody like that think of them? Quote, Nunchakus can be whipped into the legs with bone-breaking force. In addition to the power-packed momentum, the nunchaku has another lethal edge over other striking weapons, range. Skipping ahead. The weapon looks inoffensive when held closed, and this can be dangerously deceptive to the officer. He may see a loiterer casually holding a set of closed set of nunchaku and approach within, say, seven feet, a distance that appears to be safe. Suddenly, with a flick of his right wrist, the punk snaps the weapon open and upward, nailing the cop. I did a series on this subject for Karate Illustrated magazine, which argued that the weapon is too destructive to serve as a less lethal police impact weapon. Disarming an Nunchako man barehanded is as foolhardy as attempting the same with a knife wielder. Now, I don't agree with every word I just quoted, by the way, but... You get the point. Again, this is an expert opinion from the time of a high use. Here's a quotation from a different martial arts author. Anyway, my best friend back then had a set of Cocobolo chucks that were exceptionally nasty because they were octagonal. Skipping ahead, the octagonal profile had eight sharp corners along its length which would break the skin with every strike. He carried them in his back pocket under his cut-off flannel shirt and used them to beat several people into the hospital. Also, a guy who today runs a boxing gym, and I kind of looked him up after I found his comment on a message board, and it seems very legit. He has a LinkedIn profile about being the head of this boxing gym and everything. He was a Shorin Ru guy way back when. He used a pair to incapacitate three attackers and send the fourth one fleeing. Meanwhile, my sensei himself saw these used in the street uh, back in, well, it probably was the 70s, said the poor guy, you know, the one who'd been struck in the head, looked like someone had taken a razor blade to him. These pictures are of my new pair, the ones from Japan, by the way. Ah, love it. Anyway, funny enough, I had to move this book out of the way to take the pictures. That was actually what was just sitting in the spot. And I also researched news articles. It's not hard to find, you know, cases of effective use like this one here. And in surveying real-life cases and assaults, it basically comes down to they seem to be as effective as comparable straight baton, at the least. You know, all straight batons from around the world, I mean, they're far, far short of a one-hit, one, you know, one-stop guaranteed a tool. Not at all. I mean, these are not battle axes. It's not a mace, right? Again, just like with the nunchaku, we're talking about a one-inch diameter piece of wood that's, uh, in the baton, in the case of batons, one to two feet long. Well, that can be a great weapon, no doubt. But we could point to cases where police over the centuries uh, with wood and then even metal like ASP batons wail away on somebody and it doesn't get the job done. And these are expert baton wielders, right? Trained for it, using it every day in the street. Think of like the bobbies in England, that kind of thing. And something else I did was uh, watch actual nunchaku fights, not HEMA-style sparring, like actual fights on the internet. Not highbrow entertainment, not skilled opponents, although, hey, I'll give these guys their props. They're, they're tough, tough and crazy to do this. <laughs> and, and not quality chucks at all. Nevertheless, very useful data. There's no substitute for something like this. And guess what? I didn't see people hit themselves. I didn't see people break their own arm or numb their own arm or anything. Um, so this is where Shad and people of this school of thought, I think, just really overcomplicate things. It's pretty simple in reality. You swing with the chucks. You swing as hard as you can. You make sure you know how to swing so that you're unlikely to hit yourself. And as I'll prove in this video later, uh, you can swing at something actually as hard as you possibly can. And you'll actually be fine. Now, I've been showing a, a bunch of historical configurations of the weapon, and just one minor point we don't have time to delve into here is that nunchaku is almost a weapons system. But let's move on to my bias, because I want to admit I am biased. Uh, not only am I fascinated by odd weapons, uh, but I wrote, I guess I could say, the book on the flexible impact weapons of the West, including the Western world's equivalent of the nunchaku, you know, a civilian street weapon, and the pros and cons were very similar. And this picture's from the author's presentation I did, but anyway, 
yeah, I love flexible impact weapons. I love odd weapons. Uh, I love weapons that are so odd that even other weapon geeks look at them and say, um, hold on, what is that? And hopefully I don't let my fascination with this kind of thing uh, color my opinion. Funny enough, I have an actual Edo period Kusarigama behind me on the wall as I work on this video. Now let's move on to some more smacking. This extra long baton is high quality, a very dense South American wood, and I put it up against poplar because the guys at Mythbusters said poplar is a good bone substitute. So this long, very dense hardwood club did not even dent the poplar. It sent it flying really far away, but didn't even dent it. Let's try my new white oak made in Japan chucks. Full speed version, and you'll see a sizable shard got broken off. Now, granted, the chucks are octagonal and the baton was round, but I would argue that the classic configuration for chucks is octagonal in shape, and without question, round is the case for batons. That was a half inch thick piece of poplar. The average human skull is a quarter of an inch. Now let's talk about the purposeful unpredictability of the nunchaku. From my starting position, I can lash out from either direction with either hand, and the opponent doesn't know which one. And I can also shoot straight out. But as we've said, for the most part, this is what you do. You swing it, right? You swing it like it's a weapon, not like you're on the cheer squad at the pep rally. Sorry, I just really hate all that twirling. Now, check out this kind of crucifix block here. The horizontal stick buttresses the vertical one, so you can redirect attacks. But this here is the safer block. A lot of coverage, and you can block and, of course, strike. And you can also block and grapple, but we'll talk grappling later. Right now I want to take on, here's a couple of warm-up jabbing type strikes, but uh, I want to take on the myth and the number one criticism against this weapon that you can't strike reliably without hitting yourself. These are power shots, and this is unedited. Here's the secret, guys. Sweeping power shots are actually the safest. These kinds of shots here, these are the kinds where you can't. And even then, that worked alright. But what street punks figured out intuitively a long time ago is that you swing this in a fight as if it's a mace. I mean, do you really think people carried them for years in the street if every time you used it, you hurt yourself? Of course not. You know what this is all very much like? Brass knuckles. I don't have any in the house, but I do have Teco, so here you go. Uh, the argument has been around for centuries. You can see this in old journals and articles from the 1800s about whether or not brass knuckles are worth it. Will they just break your own hand? And we have many more data points, like much more, proving that in actual street use, real combat by people who actually know what they're doing, have maybe practiced a little bit. And yeah, they can use it safely and effectively. Funny enough, just like with uh, Nunchaku, you also get disagreements even within the pro party. So people who are pro Nux will disagree on how you should use them, but that doesn't negate anything I just said, at all. Again, the bottom line is, the great majority of people who use these kinds of things that we're looking at right here, you know, breast knuckles, so to speak, and nunchaku, have no idea what they're doing, tend to hurt themselves, and then that gives the weapon the reputation for being a liability. I mean, come on, most people carrying around a set of nux or nunchaku bought it because they think it looks cool or badass, never spent a minute worrying about practicality. But now for the main event, karate sticks love that old name, versus coconut. Martial arts lore has long said that the coconut is a good substitute for uh, the head. <laughs> um, you know, scientifically that might or might not be true, but coconuts are damn tough. And they've killed people by hitting them on the head when falling from a tree. Uh, I saw a Hema guy complain about how tough it was to use his longsword, a fully functional, sharp longsword, to get through a coconut. Meanwhile, here's what the Chucks did. My aim was a bit off, it's a small target, I must admit. Uh, if I'd hit it in the center, I have no doubt it would have completely obliterated this thing. This is almost more impressive, in a way, as a demonstration of power, because it just sheared that shell right off. I actually did hit it right on the center line, across the center line, so that's good, because remember it was tilted 90 degrees to our left at the moment when I hit it, uh, but I should have swung a little bit further out to get it right in the center. Basically, I caught it with a glancing blow. And I absolutely would have thought that would have saved the coconut, uh, but it didn't. And that really speaks to the weapon speed and concentration of force to me. Here's something else pretty nifty. Uh, you can lash out in unexpected ways with these. 
You expect that kind of a swing when you see me cocked back like that, right? Just like you would with a rigid baton. But you're not expecting this. Backhanded strike with the offhand instead of a forehand strike with the dominant hand. Including down to the knee instead of up to the head or upper body. And let's be honest, your opponent is not expecting that. So, now back to this trusty single stick I've got here, and again, it's great. I don't know exactly what kind of wood it is, but I pounced on it when I saw it at the lumber yard, and it is more dense than oak or hickory, as far as I can tell. And by the way, shout out to my duck astronaut shirt. <laughs> I was realizing it's shown up in more than one of my videos. But now to one of the biggest advantages Nachaku have over competing items kind of speed to market, right? Farm to market. How fast can you get your product there? When you tug on a stick from the Nunchaku, that cord yanks the other one to follow it really, really quickly. This is like the one thing I specifically mentioned when I responded to the Shadowversity video. Uh, the 0 to 100 factor. I hope you saw the difference there in the video, and the thing is, with the Nunchaku, you can do it from any angle. You can do a full power strike, go 0 from 100, going pure south to pure north. You cannot do that with a straight stick. You know how, I mean, especially with a heavy stick, you know, a, a serious hardwood. You know how with a weapon, you kind of have to get through first gear as quickly as you can, right? Generate power and then speed up. But with the Nunchaku, you really bypass that to some extent. And that being said, a heavy, rigid baton like this, of course, has plenty of power. Uh, it might not have gotten through the poplar, but it laughed its way through that plank in the last video, that last segment. And yeah, that's the same wood that two short steel batons of different types couldn't get through. This kind of baton, it's more like a semi, and the Nunchaku is more like a bullet. This is, it has this real driving impact. And of course, I can block with something like this much more easily. You know, who's to say which is better overall? I'm just saying that the Nunchaku, in comparison, is far from a garbage weapon. In fact, I think it's quite good. Now, however, Shad and others have a point that no matter what you do, no matter how much you train, you can hit your own hand. That is a 100% full power swing with proper pullback, and I still wrapped myself across the knuckles. And you know what? My hand was fine. And that's with a power shot that you would never pull off in a fight. I mean, I telegraphed that shot from all the way down Main Street and then some. And by the way, I would disagree with the pro Nunchaku faction that says you can't strike with this weapon on a single plane, and that's why I hit my own hand. That is in part why I hit my own hand, but how terrible would a weapon be if you had to completely avoid some angles of attack? No, just swing properly, and even if you do hit your hand or arm, it's not a big deal. I mean, I whacked stuff over multiple days making this video, and uh, I never got so much as a visible bruise on my hand or forearm, and I never hit my head. Uh, that's, you'd have to you have to try really hard to do that, like, just swing really badly. Ever seen that grip before? That was taught to cops back in the 80s. Anyway, this tree is, I don't know, a hundred, a thousand times more unyielding than any part of a person's body, and I'm whacking it with no effect on myself. Now, let's talk concealment and some serious old-time tricks. Here's the thing, everything we've talked about in terms of the Nunchaku, its advantages, I'm not saying it's better overall necessarily, but it has a lot of advantages. Look at that reach. I get a bludgeon with that kind of reach that fit easily in my front pocket, and fits easily in my back pocket, and it's well hidden. When it comes to this, uh, Shad said you could conceal a stick, like a rigid stick, as well as with one of these, like, you know, come on man, <laughs> that's just not serious. Uh, nobody's concealing a stick the length of unfurled nunchaku on their person and walking around, not even with a trench coat or whatever. That would be horribly awkward to walk around in, uh, but not as awkward as trying to quickly deploy that weapon in your defense. Ever seen that before? Kind of like drawing a gun from a uh, shoulder holster, right? And if your argument is, well, might as well carry a gun, that's academic because obviously no impact weapon or edged weapon is going to compare to a gun. A long shirt, of course, completely conceals the item. You might think that all this fabric would get in the way of deployment. It doesn't. And back to this draw, notice how I barely have to put my hand in. I'm letting you see the item, but you wouldn't, of course, normally do that, right? There it is. Just half my hand, and it's ready. This is some old-school stuff right here. I love this. Uh, and yeah, you have to kind of work it, or it's not going to function properly, right? You can get it stuck as you deploy if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, but people back in the day figured out how to do this. Speaking of back in the day, this is all for historical purposes, guys. Uh, it's probably illegal for you to carry nunchucks wherever you live, to carry them concealed even more so, and definitely to hit anyone with them. So don't do that. 
Now we've got to move on to grappling, because chucks are not just decent for grappling, good at grappling, they're great for grappling. Most of the big weapons slash martial arts YouTubers that have covered nunchakus don't even mention this aspect. Shadowversity, that video at least mentions it, but just dismisses it immediately out of hand with, uh, gotta say, no research. Uh, no, nunchaku are very effective. This is street proven. But before we get to that, I've been choked unconscious by belts, right, like martial arts, right, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu belts, by sleeves, like a gi top sleeve. I've even been choked unconscious uh, with a t-shirt I was wearing, and I remember the guy applying the choke on me, and I was like, well, there's no way this is going to work, right? <laughs> my t-shirt collar's just going to rip. Nope. I went to sleep. And, you know, yeah, I've been submitted on my arms and legs, and of course neck, uh, with just the human body, right, as the weapon. None of those compare to the exquisite pain of having what is basically a giant vice applied to you. Officer Day, quoted here, didn't know anything about nunchakus until he got trained with them, and he ended up finding them so useful for police work, he's now an instructor. How about I quote from a captain at a county jail? Two inmates were fighting and they couldn't be separated. Quote, I applied it to an individual's leg and pulled back, and he couldn't get away quick enough from the other guy. How about this? In 1988, the San Diego PD did a trial run. It was going to be a four-month trial run. The officers testing it reported 312 uses, only 10 of which involved impact. So they used it hundreds of times to subdue people, using it on the streets, real situations, not dojo theorizing, to subdue antagonists. Police administrators canceled the final month of the test and went ahead and began training all their officers in the tool. That's how well it was working out. Nor is that the only time police successfully, you know, experimented with or used nunchaku in the streets, especially as a grappling tool. The problem is always the same. Their reputation is so nasty as an instrument that police can't end up carrying them for uh, public relations reasons. And this dovetails back to how in the world this instrument could be both the most overrated and yet underrated weapon in the world, which I really think it is. I spent a lot of time here trying to justify how underrated it is, and I think it is. How did it get to be so overrated? Well, because of this guy. <laughs> this guy here, right? And entertainment in general. The pop culture consciousness thinks of Nunchaku as this horribly effective, vicious weapon. And I think it is quite effective, but of course it's not what you see in the movies. You know what it's like? It's like the katana. You know, is the katana a good weapon? Absolutely. Is it the virtual lightsaber that movies would have us believe? Well, of course not. And it's subject to the same strengths and weaknesses as most swords. Same thing with this. The nunchaku is, at its heart, a wooden rod, and its limitations are going to be based on that surprisingly more so than by their unique configuration, their flexibility. And the myth of their lack of effectiveness is just based on a lack of research. Uh, like this guy right here. A man broke into a house in Burlington, the homeowner defended himself with nunchaku, one strike to the head, and the criminal had to be care flighted to the hospital. Meanwhile, the myth that it's too dangerous to the user is based on a lack of practice. You can't experiment with one of these things. Yeah, it's a complex weapon, way more complex than a rigid stick. You can't do that for just a couple of hours and know whether or not that's the case. Can you hurt yourself with it? Absolutely. People have knocked their teeth out. Uh, one guy fractured his own skull with it. And in every case I could find, that wasn't somebody swinging with it as a weapon. They were doing their little majorette baton twirling with it. You know, long before Bruce Lee introduced this instrument to the West, there was a saying in the West, no fence against a flail, meaning you can't defend against a flail. Why? Because it can wrap around a block or a weapon and still hit you. I've done that myself in weapons sparring oh, a million years ago, but I did. Uh, it's a practical technique. You can see it in other martial arts with flexible instruments, like in, uh, like in Kali with uh, the trapo. Just one more practical aspect of what I consider to be a very practical weapon. Thanks.